Okay, great. All right, um, so I'm going to get started and keep an eye on participants in the chat as we go. Um, so welcome. Like I said, this is my first time doing a Zoom presentation. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm going to do my best to take this new technology in stride. Um, I know I recognize some of your names, but if, you have, if I haven't met you before, uh, my name is Eleanor Harris. I am one of the co-directors here at the Clifton Institute. My husband slash co-director is also on the meeting, so he'll be managing the questions, like I said, and can help with any issues. Um, if you're in the meeting, you somehow found your way to our website. So if you want to learn more about what we're working on, you can learn more there or on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash clifton.institute. Um, we're trying to put as much stuff as, online as we can at the moment. This kind of thing, of course, is much more fun when we can do it in person, but I'm grateful that we have some technological workarounds uh, for the moment anyway. So um, the title that we advertised with this talk was The Secret of Species. Um, Bert convinced me it would convince more people to come if there was a little alliteration in the title. But really what the talk is going to be about is what is a species anyway. Um, I'm not going to go give a detailed bi biography of myself, but a couple bi biographical notes that kind of motivate the talk are first that I was actually a math major in college and it wasn't until my senior year of college that I got interested in biology. Um, and so then when I went on to uh, study mathematical biology in my graduate work, um, I was kind of all of a sudden in the midst of all these biologists who were all studying species and conserving species and talking about species all the time. And I kind of felt like I had missed the boat and didn't quite know why everyone was so fascinated with species. Um, and at the same time, I started dating my now husband, who is an avid bird watcher and also just likes to keep lists of all of the species of birds and plants and everything else that he sees. So in my early 20s, I was starting to spend a lot of time at work with people who really liked and cared about and were interested in species and also a lot of my free time with people who liked counting species and seeing species and seeing talking about species all the time. Um, and so I kind of got curious about what the big deal was and wanted to dive a little bit deeper in and understand why this was such a, an important concept. And so over the last few years, I've been doing a lot of reading kind of why it's an important concept um, and I have come to convince myself that it is really the fundamental concept in evolutionary biology. Um, the story behind this picture is that a few years ago Bert and I took a trip to Hawaii and we went to one of the rainiest spots on earth and spent a couple days backpacking in this jungle to see a little bird called the Puaiohi. Um, it's an endangered species, there's maybe fewer than a hundred left in the world and we went to really great lengths to see what is maybe not the most beautiful species in the world, but one of the rarest. Um, and of course, we're not the only ones who like traveling um, both remotely and locally to see species. Um, if any of you have seen this movie, The Big Year, it tells the story of three bird watchers who go to great lengths to spend a year trying to see as many species of birds as they can um, in North America. Um, it's a great movie, I would recommend it, um, and it gives a little insight into the crazy lengths bird watchers go to find as many species as they can. Um, here at the Clifton Institute, we're also really interested in species. We have an iNaturalist project where we keep a list of all the species that have been documented here on our property. This is actually a little bit out of date, it's a couple months old, so you can see back in January that we had found and documented over 1,200 species here on our field station. Um, if you ever go to a state park or a national park or a wildlife preserve and you're interested in what you're going to see there, usually they'll report that in numbers of species. Of Here I found some uh, websites where they were advertising the number of ferns that you could see or the butterflies or the birds. It's all about species. Um, I pulled a few headlines. This was back in January when I was pulling these headlines. So there were a lot of stories at the time of all the new species that had been documented in 2019. So there were all sorts of scientific discoveries last year. And usually the language that was used to describe them was species, new species found, new species discovered. Um, and really anytime there's new science about a plant or an animal, 
we also use the language species in that concept, in that context. So here are a few headlines again back from January about species of crocodiles, species of shrimp, species of parasitic, parasitic wasps that can do all sorts of crazy things. Um, when we have problems with various plants and animals, we use the word species there too. So we're battling invasive species here on our field station and we're by no means the only ones that are doing that. And globally, when we think about plants and animals that are being lost for various reasons, um, again, it's the language is always about the number of species that are being lost, the number of species that are going extinct. Um, so all over the world, scientists, journalists, citizen scientists, everyone is obsessed with species. And the question is why? Um, because that's not the only words that we can use to describe the vast diversity of plants and animals out in the natural world. Um, all of living organisms are scientifically organized into a hierarchical classification, and the broadest level in that hierarchy is kingdoms. So pretty much everything that we can see with our naked eyes is organized into four kingdoms, the animals, the plants, the fungi, and the protists. Those kingdoms are then subdivided into phyla. So within the kingdom of animals, two of the phyla are chordates, so that includes vertebrates like us. Um, another phylum would be the mollusks. So they're still pretty broad categories of animals. Those phyla are further subdivided into classes. So for instance, within the chordates, you have the birds and the mammals. The, the classes are divided into orders. So for instance, within the birds, you can have the passerines, which are the tweedy birds who can perch on branches and the anseriforms, that's all the ducks and the geese. So now we're starting to get to a level where the things in the orders are pretty similar looking to each other, but we can still keep subdividing. So the next level down is family. Within the passerines, two of the families are the corvids, so that's blue jays and crows. Um, another would be the cardinals. And then finally, we are at the level where we can get to genus. So a family is divided into genera. So for instance, um, Corvus and Cyanocida in the Corvids. And then we're at last at species. So the genus Corvus is divided into multiple species, two of which are the American crow and the common raven. Um, so there are all these different levels of organization and we happen to be very focused on species, but there's no reason why we couldn't count the number of families that we've seen out in nature or document the different genes that are present in a population. If we're interested in conservation, maybe we could ignore species and just make sure that there are enough breeding females in a given habitat. Um, or if you're a photographer, you could forget about species and maybe just take pictures of all the different colors that you could find in nature. And you could keep going and going and going with different things that you might be interested in counting or discovering. But we still seem to be coming back to species. So that's um, really the question of the talk is why do we care so much about species? The first reason is that human beings just love categories. We look out there in nature, and we feel the need to categorize what we're seeing. We also need categories just so that we can have a common language about what we're seeing and observing when we're studying them or trying to communicate what we found out there. We need some way of organizing what we're seeing. Um, and this is called the nominalistic species concept. So it's the idea that we're really just imposing artificial human constructs, categories on all the natural world that nature doesn't really care about, but it's just a convenience um, for human scientists and naturalists. Um, some people think that's really all a species is, but I'm going to argue today that there's more to it than that. Um, so this is an outline of the rest of the talk. I'm going to show that organisms in nature come organized in groups of similar looking individuals that cannot breed with members of other groups. And I'm going to show how these groups actually arise through an evolutionary process. And hopefully that will convince you, as it's convinced me, that they're not just artificial categories, they really exist in nature. Um, I'll give some caveats at the end that it's a very complicated situation um, and finish with some reasons that I think we should care about species. So to come back to this picture, um, I think the thing that I'm most struck by is just the vast amount of diversity. There are so many types of plants and probably if we could look closer, animals as well, all sorts of different shades of green, shapes of leaves, uh, little mosses, big trees, all sorts of plants. And, but you don't have to go to the tropics to see such an amazing amount of diversity. 
This is a picture we took on our property last July during summer camp. We've got some humans in the middle, but then they're surrounded by all sorts of plants. Again, I can see all sorts of different colors of leaves, shapes of leaves. I'm sure if we actually went and counted the different types of things in this picture, we would get a really big number. Um, and they're all not just plants, there are lots of birds. And these are just pictures of things that live here in North America, all sorts of different birds and fish and mushrooms and trees, beetles, butterflies, mammals that used to live here. Um, and I just have to give a plug to my favorite animal here in North America, the rosy maple moth that looks like a Muppet, but is really a really cool moth. So come out and check it out sometime. Um, and so people have been studying and noticing this vast amount of biological diversity for a really long time. Um, Charles Darwin famously said that endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. But there's a special structure to all this diversity out there. There's not just any possible combination of traits that you could imagine. They come organized in groups of organisms that look like each other, but not like members of other groups. So for instance, on the left are pictures of common milkweed. They have these spherical clusters of pink flowers and pretty broad leaves. And on the right uh, is a species called butterfly milkweed. Um, they come in kind of more umbrella-shaped clusters of orange flowers with long, narrow, skinny leaves. So there are all sorts of pink, spherical, broad-leafed milkweeds, all sorts of orange-flowered, skinny-leafed milkweeds, but nothing in between. People have also been noticing this property, that organisms seem to come organized into discrete groups for a really long time. Um, and this is called the typological species concept. It's the idea that a species is just a group of organisms that look like each other, and the scientist's task is to go and find these groups and put every individual in its appropriate group. But there's still something missing from this story. All of these groups have a very special property. Um, usually, organisms from different groups cannot breed with each other and make intermediate offspring. So that's why the common milkweeds keep reproducing and producing more pink common milkweeds. The butterfly milkweeds keep breeding true and making orange butterfly milkweeds, and there's nothing in between. And this leads to the definition of species that you are probably most familiar with. It's called the biological species concept. And in this definition, a species is defined as a population of organisms that actually or potentially interbreed in nature. So years ago, when I was first starting to feel really conflicted about the idea of species, it was this definition that was causing me so much turmoil, because it just kind of sounds like scientific gobbledygook. And it uh, was unclear to me at the time what its basis in reality was. So the first question is, are there even such populations out in nature? I think we've already talked about the fact that there are actually these discrete populations of organisms out there. But next, the next question is, why they exist in the first place? Um, and this is something that I hadn't really thought about until I read this book by Jody Hay called Genes, Categories, and Species. I had never considered the fact that there could be alternate realities where maybe there were groups of organisms out there, but they could perfectly well interbreed and make, make a hybrid offspring. Um, so we can do a little thought experiment. If you ever watched Star Trek The Next Generation, you'll know that the crew of the Enterprise traveled the universe, finding strange planets where organisms looked very different from ourselves. There were immortal beings and beings that looked like crystal and that were vaguely humanoid, but kind of different. If I were to write an episode of Star Trek, I would call it the hybrid zone, and the crew of the Enterprise would find themselves on a planet where any two living organisms could breed and produce an offspring. And that seems like a perfectly plausible situation to me. There's no a priori reason why maybe a duck and a cardinal couldn't interbreed and make something like this red duck from a coke ad. Um, that seems like a perfectly biological reality that you could imagine out there, but it's not the way our world works. On our world, it seems that organisms can only reproduce with other organisms that look like them in some respect. So the question is why these groups of interbreeding organisms exist in the first place. Uh, Theodosia Stabchansky was uh, a preeminent biologist and evolutionary theorist in the mid 20th century. And he famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So that's what we're gonna to use to understand why these groups exist. We're gonna to try to see how they've arise through an evolutionary process. 
So imagine, if you will, a population of salamanders living somewhere out there in the world. They're going to be born, they'll eat and grow and grow up and reproduce with each other so the population will grow. And likely they'll make more babies than the habitat can support. So maybe in the winter, a lot of them will die off and we'll be back to our original population size. It'll happen again, they'll reproduce, some individuals will die. Every so often, one of those babies will be born with a mutation. Something different that makes it maybe look a little different or behave a little different or smell a little different. So in this case, one of the baby salamanders was born with a yellow tail. The vast majority of the time that that happens, it's not going to be good news for that salamander. That mutation is going to be detrimental for, for some reason. Maybe it makes it more easy to get caught by predators, something like that. So that mutated yellow-tailed salamander is not going to survive to become an adult. And again, every now and then a new mutation will arise. So maybe this time a pink-headed salamander will be born, even though not, neither of his parents had pink heads. And very rarely a mutation like that will actually be beneficial to the salamander and it'll help it survive and help it reproduce even more than its peers. So we'll have more pink-headed salamanders in the next generation. And then eventually all of the salamanders will have pink heads. Maybe in a few more generations, one of the salamanders will have a mutation that lets it drop off its tail when it feels like it. So one of the salamanders in the upper right hand corner now has a chopped off tail because they can drop their tails when they want. And eventually that mutation too will spread throughout the population. Now imagine that population for some reason gets subdivided into two groups that can't interact with each other anymore. They're never gonna see each other. So the population on the left, maybe eventually they'll all have green tails and maybe eventually they'll all have night vision. I could imagine that being a really great adaptation. Maybe the population on the right will evolve pink polka dots, and then in a few generations, they're going to get really big. Excuse me. So the first question is why such a separation would happen in the first place. And it can happen actually for many different reasons. So I'm going to give a few examples that are relevant uh, to roughly our area. Um, so again, imagine our population of salamanders, and in this case, they're distributed over a mountain range. They can live on the, the slopes of the mountain, up on the tops of the mountain, and then the valleys as well. And this was the case millions of years ago. There would have been salamanders all over the mountains here in Appalachia. But during the Pliocene, uh, three to five million years ago, things got pretty arid and dry. So the mountain tops were still good places for salamanders to live. But the lower elevations and the valleys became too hot and dry for salamanders to live there anymore. And they actually lost their ability to traverse the valleys. So we end up with two isolated populations of mountains in this case, and actually over, the, over Appalachia, many, many isolated mountaintops with isolated populations of salamanders at the tops of the mountains. And this uh, gave rise to this situation where on different mountaintops, some of them are inhabited by what's called Worla's salamander. And one special mountaintop near us, um, up near Strasbourg, is home to the cow knob salamander. So many, many millions of years ago, these would have been the same salamander, but over time, as they got isolated on different mountaintops, they started to look pretty different. Um, a similar situation happened with birds. So millions of years ago, populations of birds would have been distributed across the entire um, United States. And during the Pleistocene, over the last couple of million years ago, we've gone through successive stages of glaciation. So this shows roughly um, the maximum extent of glaciation uh, in North America. And you can see there's kind of a tongue of the glacier that comes down right through the middle of the country. So the glacier itself would have been impassable to birds, but then all around the glacier, um, it would have made uh, the, the land very, very cold and barren and not good habitat for birds. So there would have been kind of a dividing line from the glacier all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico that would have separated any birds into an eastern and western population. And probably over the course of that, that division, they would have gotten specialized to the biomes in the eastern and western halves of the continent, which are quite different. So in the east, we have a pretty wet temperate forest. And in the wet west, um, things are a lot drier and a lot grass grassier. Um, so as they became subdivided into two, they would have started to adapt to those different biomes. <clears throat> 
So eventually we'd have, we would have had two neighboring populations of birds that didn't intermix anymore. And if you flip through your bird guide, you can actually find lots and lots and lots of pairs of species that were divided in just this way. So one example is the spotted tohi on the left and the eastern tohi on the right. Um, I'm, I grew up, and I imagine some of you did as well, calling this the rufous-sided tohi. And in the last couple of decades, um, it's been divided into two because they look similar but quite different. Um, and you can see that the two populations divide themselves pretty nicely along that north-south line. Same with Bullock's Orioles and Baltimore Orioles. Um, they would have ancestrally have been the same species and they've become subdivided in the western and eastern halves of the country. Um, the, the grackles are similar. They're not quite as northern distributed, but again, there's a nice east-west division between the great-tailed grackle and the common grackle. Um, and this is just a, a list of some of the pairs of species that if you flip through your field guide, you'll see that those range maps map pretty nicely into western and eastern halves. Another interesting way that this can happen is not western and eastern division, but rather northern uh, southern division, especially with the addition of migration. So on the left, I'm showing a common yellowthroat, and on the right, an Altamira yellowthroat. They look pretty similar. Um, and in the map, you can see most of the color is the range of the common yellowthroat, but the bright pink dot is the range, the entire range of the Altamira yellowthroat. So the blue range shows that these two birds will be in the same area during the winter, but during the summer, the common yellowthroat has started to migrate up into North America. So during the time that they're breeding, these birds will never interact with each other. Even though they spend half the year together, they spend the significant part of the year separately and they will never be able to interbreed and they've become isolated that way. And there are other examples of, examples of birds that have become divided based on migratory or non-migratory behavior. Um, this is a cool example with cicadas. There are two different groups of cicadas. One of them emerges every 13 years. One of them emerges every 17 years. So again, they can live in really the exact same geographic location, but since they emerge in different years, they're never gonna be breeding at the same time. So they'll never be able to interbreed with each other, except I think every 221 years. So they have many generations when they're breeding separately and they've evolved some differences during that time. Um, this is an interesting example. There are many insects that lay their eggs in very specific species of plants, um, and the apple maggot fly is one of those. So historically, they would have only laid their eggs in the leaves of the hawthorn plant, but once Europeans brought apples to North America, some of the apple maggot flies started to lay their eggs in apple leaves. So now there are two separate populations of the apple maggot flies, some of which breed only on hawthorn leaves, some of which breed only on apple leaves. Um, and they're, we scientists think they're basically on their way to becoming two separate species over the course of just a couple hundred years of isolation on these two separate host plants. Um, similarly with these two butterflies and other butterflies as well, um, the Edwards hair streak and the hickory hair streak, they look pretty similar, but there are some differences. Um, and the reason for these differences is, is that the Edwards hair streak at the moment only lays its eggs in oak leaves, whereas the hickory hair streak, as its name would suggest, lays its eggs in hickory leaves. So again, they can occur in the very same forest, but since they're using different host plants and they meet near those host plants, members of these two subpopulations are never going to intermingle with each other. Let's see, I think I have... Um, and as a side note, um, when I was preparing this talk, I wanted to figure out, learn about hairy and downy woodpeckers, which are shown in this picture. Um, these are two of my nemeses bird watching. I have a very hard time telling them apart, especially by ear. Um, the size difference is pretty notable. The hairy is on the left. Um, but if you're seeing one of them by itself, I still have a hard time telling them apart. And I was hoping to learn what had initially driven this population of similar looking woodpeckers apart. And I actually learned that they are not that closely related and the downy woodpecker has actually evolved to look like the hairy woodpecker because it's so big and strong and it's a bully at bird feeders. So if the downy can kind of sneak in and look like a hairy woodpecker, it'll get a lot of food. So that was just kind of an interesting side note that I learned. Okay, so that was a handful of examples. There are other ways that it can happen, but for some reason, there are all sorts of ways it can happen. A population will get divided into two. And over the course of that isolation, the two subgroups will start to look very different. So, so far in our story, we have come up with organisms naturally organized into groups of similar looking individuals 
But the next step is that we have to show why they can't breed with members of other groups. So if we have our night vision green-tailed salamander on the left, our pink polka-dotted big salamander on the right, why can't they just interbreed and form kind of an intermediate form, maybe with night vision and pink polka dots and an intermediate size? That seems like it should be able to happen, but it often can't. And again, there are many reasons why that can't happen. So the first is that maybe that green-tailed salamander and the polka dot salamander don't even recognize each other as potential mates anymore. Over the time that they've spent apart, they don't even consider each other viable mates. And this happens, um, this happened in the case of the willow and the alder flycatcher. They look very similar, um, but they have pretty different calls. Um, so a female of either of these species won't even recognize a male of the other, uh, the other species as a potential mate because its song is so different than the one that she learned as a, as a young bird. Even if they can recognize each other as potential mates, they may not be able to physically breed with each other and because over the time that they've spent apart, um, their reproductive, reproductive anatomy will have changed. So this is um, seen in the dragonflies. In order to breed, a male dragonfly needs to grasp on with its abdomen onto the female's neck. And you can see some of the um, grasping appendages here in the middle of the screen. And the females have a corresponding more or less puzzle piece fit um, on the back of their neck. So if the two pieces don't match up, they won't be able to physically breed. Um, there's an interesting study um, in the paper that I cited down there. They put males and females from different species into a room together. The males seem to have no problem recognizing the females of the other species as potential mates. They were very interested, but they just couldn't physically grab on. Um, and these grasping appendages, they don't really have any functional purpose. There's no reason that these different shapes should have evolved. Um, it's probably just a case of things drifting over time and their, their shapes kind of became different over many generations apart. Okay, so now imagine groups that maybe they can recognize each other, maybe they can physically breed with each other, but perhaps when they try to make offspring, those offspring are either inviable, unhealthy, or infertile. And that is the case in a lot of pairs of species. Um, and the reason for that, I think this is really the crux of why species can't breed with each other. And to understand why, um, we have to look a little more deeply at their, uh, their genetics, at their DNA. Um, Pretty much every plant and animal at some point in its life cycle has at least two copies of every one of its genes. So that's what I'm um, just showing here in the cartoon. There's two copies of a kind of a chunk of DNA. Um, at the left, this individual has two copies of big A genes. And on the right, they have two copies of big B genes. And at the vast majority of genes in a, in a population, all the population members are gonna have the exact same gene and both of its copies. But now, again, imagine that the population has become subdivided in two. In one population, one lucky individual is going to mutate and get a little a at that left-hand gene. And if it's advantageous, it's gonna spread throughout the entire population until everybody has two copies of little a. And maybe in the other population, one lucky individual evolved a little b gene at the right-hand genes. And if it's beneficial, then eventually everybody will have two copies of little b at the right-hand gene. So now we have our two different looking subgroups. And if members of those two subgroups try to meet, their DNA is gonna get mixed up. So you're gonna get an offspring that has a big A with a little a and a big B with a little b. The little a and the little b genes have never before been seen in an, in a, in an organism. And DNA, it turns out, is actually a really um, kind of fragile mechanism. It's a very powerful thing that can create amazing complexity, amazing or organisms, but you can't monkey with it any which way and get a viable offspring. Um, and the vast majority of the time that you try to kind of combine different genes, if they haven't been given a test run in evolutionary time, they're not going to produce a viable or fertile animal. So that's the, this is kind of the fundamental reason that we're not living in my Star Trek world. The way our DNA seems to be constructed is that you have to be very careful with the mutations that you can combine with each other. And maybe on another planet, you could have a completely different genetic system that would be a little bit more flexible. Um, this, can, this can be seen in lots of pairs of sister species. 
Um, so for example, a red oak and a pin oak can pollinate each other and produce an acorn, but if you try to plant that acorn, it just won't germinate. It's not a healthy, viable acorn that'll turn into an oak tree. Um, similarly, a fowler's toad and a Gulf Coast toad can mate with each other, and they'll actually produce a viable offspring, but they won't be very healthy or fertile. It kind of depends on the situation. Um, but again, there's some kind of mismatch between the different genes that have appeared in these two different species. So we've so far seen three ways that members of different groups can lose the ability to mate with each other. That's if they can't recognize each other, if they can't physically breed with each other, or if they can't produce healthy offspring. And these kind of barriers to reproducing are called mating barriers. And what we've talked about so far is that they arise during that extended period of isolation that the two, two different subpopulations have experienced. But they can also arise actually in a more interesting way. So now let's imagine two species that can recognize each other as potential mates, they can physically breed, they can produce a perfectly viable offspring, but you have to think about what that offspring would be like in the natural world. So for an example, we can look at the three-spined stickleback, um, and they live up in Canada, and there's two different um, types of them. Some of them live in shallow water, and some of them live in deep water. And you can see the phys physical differences that are that they're adapted to those two different habitats. The bigger one lives out in the deep water. It has slightly lower set eyes. It's slightly darker, so it can camouflage out in the deep water, um, and conversely with a little one. They're pretty different looking, and they're adapted to those two different habitats. These two groups can reproduce and produce a viable offspring, but there's something wrong with it. So. Uh, scientists up in Canada actually measured the growth rate of these two different subpopulations in a lake. And you can see um, on the x-axis, they tested their growth rate in shallow water and in open water. And in shallow water, the shallow water fish grew a lot faster. And in open water fish, the open water fish grew a lot faster. But if they put hybrids in those habitats, they didn't do as well as either of the parent species. So the hybrids were kind of a mix. And they just weren't very well adapted to either of the two habitats. They had kind of a funny intermediate um, look, and they just weren't really adapted to either of the habitats as well as the two parent species were. So the hybrids were just not going to grow very quickly. Um, and the problem is that that's just a waste of energy and resources for these parents to have made the offspring. They don't want to waste their eggs. They don't want to waste their sperm. They don't want to waste any time that they spent taking care of the eggs or protecting them if their offspring are going to go and not grow very quickly. Um, a similar example comes from um, chorus frogs. There are two species of chorus frogs here in the eastern US, one down in Florida, one a bit uh, further north than that. And what I'm showing on the right is the mating calls that the males of these two species produce. So the um, one called P. negrita produces these kind of series of staccato calls. And the one called P. feriarum produces a very quick trill. And these two species can actually hybridize and produce a viable offspring. But unfortunately, their songs are somewhere in between. They're kind of medium rate. And the females of the species don't like that. They're very particular about the, the songs that they're looking for in a male, and these intermediate guys are just never gonna get reproduced with. So again, there's a really big cost into investing in an offspring if it's not gonna be able to reproduce. So many, many times species actually evolve these mating barriers to prevent mixing with the other group once they come back into contact. So that is, they can um, evolve different recognition systems, different um, physical reproductive anatomy, just to avoid wasting your energy mating with a subgroup if your offspring aren't going to be very healthy. Um, so, so far in the story, we've seen that um, Natural organisms come organized into groups of similar looking individuals that cannot breed with members of other groups. And we've seen how these groups actually arise through an evolutionary process. So we see that evolution produces groups of organisms that only reproduce with other organisms that look like them in some respect. And that's the basis for the biological species concept, which again is a species. A species is a population of organisms that actually are potentially interbreed in nature. This definition is so important because uh, the fact that separate species cannot breed both reflects their very distinct evolutionary histories and it also keeps them on separate evolutionary paths going into the future. 
So the fact that they can't interbreed with each other is kind of the fundamental both creator of separate groups and it keeps the separate groups the way they are. Um, so that kind of that real that uh, realization finally convinced me and I hope does as does you as well that species are not just artificial categories, but they really exist out in nature. So to review the whole process, um, we started with a uniform group of blue salamanders who evolved pink heads and then they could lose their uh, tails. One of the groups went on to evolve green tails and night vision and the other group evolved pink polka dots and got big. Um, but another way of looking at this is what's called an evolutionary tree. So this basically captures all the information that was uh, shown in all those little in animals. You can imagine basically a blue population evolving into a red one that then divides into green and then purple and yellow and then black. And this process is the basis of all the evolutionary trees you'll see in textbooks and scientific papers. This kind of division um, and then maintenance of two separate paths is the fundamental um, unit of evolutionary biology. So, and then it can happen not just once, but over and over and over again. And that produces a whole branching evolutionary tree. So for example, for example um, this is the evolutionary tree of oaks. And you can just see that branching process over and over and over again as a group got subsequently subdivided and subdivided and subdivided. Um, the last point is just to say that that's a nice story that captures a lot of what's going on out there, but it can be quite complicated. And I'm going to give a couple examples of how. Um, species are real, but that doesn't mean that they're easy to delineate. So again, if this is kind of the cartoon of our evolutionary process, where do we d draw the line? When is it, when are we comfortable saying that species have diverged from each other? Is it maybe right here when they're no longer interbreeding with each other? Is it maybe here, the moment that they start to separate from each other? Or do we want to wait a few generations and make sure they're really on separate evolutionary paths? Different scientists have different opinions about when we should draw the line, and it's not really clear. Um, I, there's not an obvious best answer to me anyway. And even if we knew this entire evolutionary history, that would be a difficult question. But unfortunately, we can only look at species at a given moment in time. And it's really difficult to tell empirically at not only at one point in the tree we are, but when, when we should call them species or not. Um, this is a really interesting example. There are two species of warblers that both migrate through um, Northern Virginia. We had a blue-winged warbler here on the property just um, last week or so. Um, there's two species of warblers, one called the blue-winged warbler, one called the golden-winged warbler. You can see they look pretty different. Um, and they sound quite different as well. And they've been recognized as a uh, separate species for a couple hundred years now. Unfortunately, they can actually reproduce and produce viable, healthy offspring. So in the lower right-hand corner, I'm showing um, the hybrid species that are hybrid birds that can result from these two species mating. Um, on the left-hand column are the parent species, and on the right-hand column are two separate um, combinations of traits that you can get when these two species interbreed. And the really interesting conservation story here is that historically these warblers had somewhat distinct ranges, which is part of the reason that they were considered separate species. Um, but for some reason, the way that humans have modified the habitat, and it's, it's still a little bit unclear how, but for some reason in the last few decades, blue-winged warblers have started to encroach on the, ter the range of the golden-winged warbler. So you can see the overlap in the map in the, in the green color. Um, and they're for, uh, apparently very attractive to golden winged warblers, and they're hybridizing so much that pure golden winged warblers are declining really, really quickly. So this is a really interesting conservation problem as well as just kind of a theoretical scientific problem. Should we consider them two separate species if they can reproduce so easily? Um, I think there's a conservation argument to me be made for them considering separate species because they've had separate evolutionary histories and we want to preserve that. Um, and then this, the kind of interesting theoretical side is what does this tree actually look like? Have they had really very separate um, evolutionary paths that are just starting to mix a little bit now here um, in the last few decades or what's going on? Um, so that's still kind of a, an area of active scientific research that people are arguing about um, really in just the last few years. Um, another really interesting example is the tiger swallowtail. 
So most of the tiger swallowtails that we, we see here in Northern Virginia are the Eastern tiger swallowtail on the left. Um, there's a species that can be found a little bit further north called the Canadian tiger swallowtail. They look pretty similar, but if you're an expert, apparently you can discern the small differences between these two species. Um, and over the past couple of decades, as summers have gotten warmer and warmer, again, it's a situation where one species is starting to encroach on the range of the other. So the eastern tiger swallowtail has actually started to move a bit north, and there's now a hybrid zone between these two species. So again, they're producing perfectly vert uh, viable, fertile, healthy offspring that we now call Appalachian tiger swail, swallowtail, excuse me. Um, but the additional complication here is that for some reason, the genetics of the crossing of the two parent species actually produces a species that emerges at a time of year that neither of the parent species is emerging. So the Eastern tiger swallowtail will emerge in either June or August in this hybrid zone. The Canadian tiger swallowtail will emerge in June and the Appalachian will only emerge in July. So now it's actually a self-reproducing population of hybrids that only mates with themselves. And so this is a really interesting example where not only can two species appear to be hybridizing, but they're actually creating a new species through the process of hybridization. Um, and I think science, scientists are starting to understand that this happens more frequently than we previous, previously thought. So that's a couple of complications that can happen with animals. The situation is much squishier and messier if you start to get to unicellular organisms. Um, if you're interested, I would definitely recommend this book by David Plomin. Um, it's about horizontal gene transfer between unicellular organisms and kind of the fascinating history behind that. So at the end of that long story, um, and at the end of all my reading and kind of learning about the evolutionary process, the processes behind species, I've come to decide that there are several reasons that we should care about species. Um, really, a species is the smallest group of organisms that have a shared evolutionary history with each other and no other organisms. So that means when we go out on a big day or when we're working on our iNaturalist project or when we're just trying to go out and count however many plants are in your yard, Counting species is really the same as counting the number of different evolutionary stories that you've experienced during your time on Earth. And I think that's a really special way to spend time. Um, discovering a new species is the same as discovering unique traits and genes that no other species is going to have. Documenting and studying species helps us understand the evolution of life on Earth. And conserving species means saving something that has been around for a really long time, that contributes to the ecosystem in a unique way, and that cannot be recovered once it's lost. So just to wrap all that up, um, we learned that organisms come naturally organized in groups of similar looking individuals that cannot breed with members of other groups. That's what a species is, and they arise through a really interesting evolutionary process. And they're not just artificial categories. They really exist out in nature with, of course, many complications. Um, and I think it's worthwhile both studying, counting, and conserving species. Um, so next time you're outside, if you're trying to find salamanders or distinguish butterflies from each other or identify oaks or learn to tell hairy and downy woodpeckers apart by ear, um, I think it's really interesting to think, keep these two questions in mind. So first, how did these species start to diverge in the first place and what's keeping them apart now? I often ask myself those questions because it's just a good way to start to think about the evolutionary history of the species that we're encountering. Because um, as Dobzhansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. But I would say that nothing in biology is any fun except in the light of evolution. Um, so that's, that's the end of the talk. I have a reading list here of some of the books that I mentioned, as well as a couple of others that I think are really wonderful resources about evolution generally. Um, if you would like any more information or other recommendations, um, please let me know. And I'm going to try, let's see if I can take I'm happy if you guys want to unmute yourselves and ask questions, and I can now see the questions in the chat. So, okay, so the first question was, can similar species mate, or do they choose not to? So I think, I hope I answered that question that um, sometimes similar species can mate, but the majority of the time there are all these barriers that keep species from, from mating with each other. And the other question is, are there other species interactions that are shifting due to climate change or other factors? Yes, that's a super interesting question. Um, it's one that actually Bert and I are actively studying at the moment. We have a project down on Mount Mitchell um, near Asheville, North Carolina. We've been going 
um, since 2016, we go down once a year and do bird surveys. And that's really the entire question of the research project. As things get warmer, generally species are gonna tend to move uphill to get, kind of, uh, get to a cooler climate. And the really interesting question is what's gonna happen up at those mountaintops where um, the mountaintop species don't have anywhere to go uphill, but they're being encroached from below by perhaps more competitive species. Um, so that's one example, and we're still kind of analyzing that data and seeing what's gonna happen. Um, but I think it's definitely, yeah, not just a question of climate change affecting individuals, but individual species, but they re it really is causing new interactions, creating new interactions between species that were, that were never before um, seen. So it's, it's a complicated, complicated issue. Um, another question, I wonder how much of the taxonomy in use needs to be revisited? Understanding that science continually refines is DNA the preferred update method now. It seems that ob observational science created so much taxonomy, so is DNA refining that picture? What other update methods are used at all? Um, great questions. Um, and I can show you, I think if I hope if you can see, still see my slide, no. Okay, here we go. Um, so the part of that question is how do, at the moment, how do, how do we um, divide new species from each other? And this is from a paper that Bert actually wrote a few years ago to describe a new species called the Sulawesi streaked flycatcher. Um, so just establishing um, genetic divergence, genetic differences between two species is really the gold standard. Um, there are, of course, lots of debate about how much divergence um, should be considered two separate species versus one species. Um, in birds, um, the other kind of pieces of information that you use to distinguish species from each other is how they look. So on the left-hand um, graph, this is kind of a collapsed picture of all sorts of different physical traits on the birds, um, and the different colors show um, different species of flycatchers as well as the putative species, and they have quite different physical traits than all the other birds. Um, so it is an observational sign. So in that, in that sense, it, you could think about it as being quite messy, but you can see that you can do, make really fine quantitative measurements of physical traits and then do pretty sophisticated um, quantitative analyses of those data. The other important thing in birds is to distinguish their songs from each other. So the right hand graph shows um, the, the spectrograms of different songs of different species of flycatchers. Um, it is a little bit of a, of a kind of a tautology that we consider two bird species distinct if they have separate songs um, when maybe those maybe they're actually interbreeding and the songs is just kind of a human construct it, it's not yeah it's like not a hard science um, but I think we're always improving the way that we can kind of quantitatively dist distinguish species from each other I hope that answered the question um, where did my chat go chat. Um, Great, any other questions? Let's see. Bit of a controversial question, but humans as a single species diverged due to geography and culture, but now there appears to be merging over a relatively short period of time. Yeah, I'm certainly within, I had this question last time I gave this talk was, you know, if there's increasing evidence that we were able to hybridize with Neanderthals when we coexisted in Europe tens of thousands of years ago. So, so should we be considered separate species or single species? Um, and that's, again, one of those complications that I was alluding to is there's two parts of that question is just theoretically, it's hard to know even when we should, if we had all the data possible in the, in the world, when is the moment that we say a new species has been created? That's not a hard and fast thing. Um, and then, of course, we're only getting fragmentary evidence in, in the case of Neanderthals from fossils and really old finds. But even now, with, say, golden wing warblers and blue wing warblers, we're not able to go out and get DNA from every single living uh, blue winged and golden wing warbler. So any DNA that we get, any songs that we measure is still a small part of the picture. Um, and it's really hard to kind of construct an entire evolutionary history from just little bits and pieces that we can gather. Great, well, I'll, um, I'm gonna turn off the recording. If you all stick around for a minute, if you have any other questions about this or anything else, I would be happy to take them. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, it's, like I said, it's really great to be able to do this online while we can't be in person, and I hope we'll be able to see you in person sometime soon. Bye.